Hey audience, now that I have debounced switches and buffered LEDs, uh, the last thing to add to this digital test box thing is a uh, clock. I'll want both an adjustable oscillator circuit as a free running clock, that'll just be a 555 timer, uh, and a toggle switch that I can use to manually clock things. Then I'll want a second switch to let me switch between the manual clock and the free running clock without having to disconnect anything. And that's where things get a little bit interesting. Uh, switching between unrelated clock sources on the fly needs to be done with a little bit more care than you might expect. Uh, I could just use a multiplexer to switch between the clocks, and it would probably be fine most of the time. Uh, I think that's what Ben Eater does in his breadboard processor video series. Uh, but in service of my irrational need to over-engineer this thing, let's do it right. So the clock is generally going to be used in some sort of edge-triggered flip-flop, like this one. By tracing through these gates, we can see that the clock signal might need to snake its way through several gates before the output of the circuit actually stabilizes. So even if the flip-flop is ostensibly an edge-triggered flip-flop, uh, it still takes time for the edge to propagate through the circuit. And if we change the clock again before the edge has fully propagated through it, uh, then, you know, weird things can happen. Uh, in other words, very short clock pulses can cause incorrect data to be latched into a clocked flip-flop. So now the problems that can arise when using an ordinary multiplexer for clocks should become clear. Uh, if we have two independent clocks, we have no idea what state the clocks are in relative to each other when we switch between them. For instance, the current clock might have just switched high and the other clock might already be low at the moment that we switch. Uh, the result will be a really short clock pulse that could ruin our day. Uh, the core of the problem here is that when we use a regular multiplexer, the output clock doesn't just transition when one of the input clocks transitions, uh, but it can also transition when the select signal changes. Just the act of switching between clocks can cause an output clock edge to occur, uh, even when neither input clock had a clock edge. Short clock pulses can also happen even when the clocks are switched when they're in the same state. Uh, for instance, the current clock might have just switched high, then we switch to the other clock, which is already high, so the act of switching itself doesn't cause a false clock edge here, but then the clock that we just switched to might immediately transition low. The problem here is that an output clock pulse can have the rising edge of one input clock and the falling edge of the other input clock without any minimum time between them. The classical solution to this problem looks like this. Uh, it's pretty common to see chains of two or three flip-flops here, which I think is to help with metastability or something, uh, but we'll ignore that for now and just look at one with a single flip-flop on each side, since that doesn't really change the fundamental idea. We can see the skeleton of an ordinary multiplexer here, but it's been exploded and these flip-flops have been inserted. Uh, the select signal gets run through this inverter to create two separate enable signals, as usual, uh, and then the enable signals get processed a bit from there. So we can see how the first problem is solved without even going into any detail here. Uh, a change in the select signal can't possibly cause a false clock edge in the output since internally the enable signals are coming from these edge-triggered flip-flops. The external select signal can now be changed whenever, but the internal enable signals will only change on clock edges, specifically falling clock edges here, which is important. The second problem, where the rising and falling edges of an output clock pulse can come from separate clocks, uh, is solved with this crossover here between halves and these extra AND gates. We can see that the enable signal for each clock is only allowed to pass into these latches uh, when the other clock is disabled. For example, if we currently have clock 1 selected, and we switch the select signal over to clock 2, uh, we need to wait for the next falling edge of clock 1, where clock 1 gets disabled, before clock 2 will even be allowed to become enabled. This makes sure that clock 1 gets to go through and finish an entire clock high period before the switch happens. There will be some time after clock 1 gets disabled and before clock 2 gets enabled, uh, during which neither clock will be enabled, and the output of the multiplexer will just be low during this time. And the flip-flop that holds the clock 2 enable signal gets triggered on clock 2's falling edge, so the circuit enables clock 2 only when it begins its next clock low period. So when we switch clocks from clock 1 to clock 2, we're guaranteed to get a full clock 1 high period, and then a full clock 2 low period, with maybe some extra time in between when neither clock is enabled. So now we have a minimum time between clock edges for both low to high and high to low transitions, so no more short clock pulses. But this circuit isn't quite appropriate for my case. Let's build it and find out why. So here it is all hooked up. Uh, the 555 timer's power source is just the output of this switch, so I can uh, 
flip the automatic clock on and off if I want. Now this bottom switch is the manual clock. And then this switch here is the select switch. If it's switched up, it selects the automatic clock and switched down, it selects the manual clock. Now, this first pair of LEDs uh, are the enable request signals. Uh, and those are just complementary signals that are connected directly to the select switch. You can see they're, they change with the select switch. The next pair of signals are the pre-enable signals, uh, which are the inputs to these, uh, these flip-flops. And then the clock enable signals, which actually go to the selection part of the multiplexer, are these two right here. And then the output of the clock multiplexer is this last red LED. So you can see right now, it's following the manual clock, because the manual clock is enabled. So let's say I've been using the manual clock, and I want to switch over to the automatic clock. Uh, so I can flip this switch up to select the automatic clock, and then nothing happens. And we can see that the manual clock is still enabled, and it will stay enabled until there's a falling edge on the manual clock. So even though I have the automatic clock selected, when I flip the manual clock, I still see the manual clock at the output of the clock multiplexer. And it's only when there's a falling edge on the manual clock that the automatic clock is then allowed to pass through. So I don't like that. I don't want to have to cycle the manual clock when I switch from the manual clock to the automatic clock. I want it to switch right over to the automatic clock. And then likewise, when I'm running with the automatic clock, I can flip over to the manual clock and we can see that the uh, automatic clock stopped coming out of the multiplexer, which seems fine and normal. But then when I flip the manual clock up, we don't see it at the output there. So even though the manual clock is allowed to be enabled, it won't actually become enabled until the next falling edge. And then we see the manual clock at the output. So with this situation, what we see is after we switch from automatic to manual mode, we lose our first manual clock pulse. So, I don't like that. So the problem here is that whenever I switch between clocks, it requires clock edges from both clocks. Uh, but, the manual clock is not always running, so there aren't any edges. So if I think about how I want this to work, uh, what I would like uh, is to have it switch over basically immediately to the other clock, um, but without requiring any transitions on the manual clock. Uh, but I also don't want to cut short any of the clock pulses from the automatic clock. Uh, so basically I want to remember what clock is currently selected and leave it selected after switching until both of the clocks are in the same state and then switch over. Uh, in other words, we need a circuit that solves problem one from earlier, but not problem two. We don't want the select switch to cause false clock transitions, uh, but we're not worried about short clock pulses caused by switching in the middle of a clock pulse. We can get away with not solving problem two because one of the clocks, the manual clock, is guaranteed not to have any transitions anywhere close to the select signal transitions. So for instance, if we have the manual clock selected and it's currently high, and we switch over to the automatic clock, and the automatic clock immediately drops low, that's fine, because the manual clock must have been high for a while before the select signal was changed. Because it just takes, you know, a long time, electrically speaking, for you to move your hand from one switch to the other. And if we switch from the automatic clock to the manual clock immediately after one of the automatic clock's transitions, uh, that's also fine, because it's going to be a while before the manual clock gets transitioned again. Again, because it takes a long time for you to move your hand from one switch to the other. The only way that problem two could possibly show up is if we tried to flip the manual clock switch at the exact same moment that we tried to switch clocks. And, um, and just, just don't do that. So the classical solution broke up the multiplexer and had this sort of break before make property, uh, where there would be a period where both clocks were disabled before enabling a new one. Uh, we don't really want that, since uh, if both clocks are disabled, the output's going to be low. Uh, but we might want to switch clocks when the output is currently high, like if the manual clock switch happens to be high when we switch over. Uh, this does sort of remind me of the set-reset flip-flops that we used for switch debouncing. Uh, the switch was break before make, where it would go through a period of neither the set nor reset input being active. 
uh, but the flip-flop itself would always be outputting one or the other. Uh, so let's get inspired by that. Uh, we can start with the same deconstructed multiplexer, where we insert more logic into the two enable signals. Now let's put a set reset flip-flop into that space. The output of the flip-flop will always be selecting one or the other, but we can gate the inputs to the flip-flop so that we can, if we want to, refuse to ask for either one to be enabled. And then the flip-flop will just remember whichever one was previously enabled and keep that one going. We've decided that the output clock should only switch sources when both input clocks are in the same state, so let's gate the select signals on another signal, and this signal will be high when the two clock inputs match and low when they differ, so an XNOR gate. We can build all of this out of NAND gates if we want to, and that's convenient since I have a bunch more of these 74 S37s lying around. So here's the new clock multiplexer circuit up and running. Uh, again, the automatic clock is up here, the manual clock is down here, the output is over here, the select switch is this one right here, and these two LEDs show the enable request signals, which are just coming off of that uh, select switch. And these two LEDs here show which one is actually enabled. Those are the actual enable signals that go to the selection part of the multiplexer. And then I have this LED right here, which is showing the output of the XNOR gate right here. Uh, and so you can see that light is on whenever the two clocks match each other. So when they're both low, it's on. And also, when they're both high, that light is on. So here we can see whenever both clocks are in the same state, whenever they're both high, the switch happens immediately. But when one of the clocks is high and one of the clocks is low, it will wait until the automatic clock switches over and matches the manual clock before it switches over. And the same thing still works when the manual clock is turned low. And so here we go. Uh, I'm kind of proud of myself for this circuit. Uh, clock multiplexing isn't the hardest problem in the world or anything, uh, but it's not exactly trivial either. Uh, and I haven't seen this solution anywhere else yet, so this might be a novel design. Uh, it's only really useful for switching between a free-running clock and a manual clock or a frozen clock. Uh, and in that case, it's probably fine to just use an ordinary multiplexer anyway. Uh, but I still think it's kind of cool. Anyway, now I have everything I need to have all sorts of fun with digital circuits, so let's go hard and build a CPU in the next video. I'll see you then.